Hello. Today, I'm going to step away from biblical text and take a look at some of the Greek gods. You may wonder why I'm examining gods most, if not all people, don't believe in today. All the videos I've made for this study center around five supernatural attributes, which the Creator must possess in order to create the universe as we see it. The Creator must have divine power, divine knowledge, oneness, and unchanging nature, and be unsearchable. All other so-called gods would not be the Creator, and would lack some, if not all, of these characteristics. I'll consider such gods to be false gods. The question now is, what would a false god look like? By considering the Greek gods, I have formed a list of indicators to highlight how these false gods lack these divine attributes. Using this new list, I then can evaluate books of the Bible and all other religious texts. Up front, I'm going to give you these indicators. There are nine in total. One, does the God have a beginning? Are they dissatisfied with their creation from the beginning? Are they afflicted by nature or by someone else against their will? Was creation an accident or incidental to the God's motivations? Is the God taught, given guidance, or is helped in some way? Is there anything hidden or kept from them? Is the God duped or tricked? Does the God gain powers or abilities they previously didn't have? Do each of the gods create a separate aspect of creation? There can be more than nine. If you can think of a tenth indicator for a false god, leave a comment and let me know. The Greek text I used to form these indicators is the Theogony and Works and Days, translated by M. L. West. These are two poems written by Hesiod, who lived in central Greece during the 8th century BC. I went through and read both of these poems, but I used the Theogony as a standard to determine these indicators. It contains the genealogy of the gods mixed with some pivotal events in their lives, such as Zeus's war with the Titans. To show how I derived this list, let's jump in and examine the text together. Let's start with the creation account. First came the chasm, and then broad-breasted earth, secure seat forever of all the immortals who occupy the peak of snowy Olympus. Out of the chasm came Erebus and dark night, and from night came bright air and day, whom she bore and shared intimacy with Erebus. Earth bore, first of all, one equal to herself, starry heaven, so that he should cover her all about, to be a secure seat forever for the blessed gods. The word chasm here is the Greek word chaos. In this translation by West, the words earth and heaven are used. I want to interpret the text in the way the first readers would understand it. Hesiod considers earth and heaven as well as night, bright air, and day, to be gods in their own right. So going forward, I'm going to use the Greek names for these gods. For earth, the Greek name is Gaia, and for heaven, the Greek name is Aranos. Chaos is the first of these early gods, or possibly is a place the gods came from. Chaos appears to have a beginning when the text says, first came the chasm. If the gods had a beginning, then they would lack an unchanging nature. There would have been a time when they didn't exist, followed by a time when they began to exist. This is my first indicator. Does the god have a beginning? If chaos and the gods from chaos had a beginning, then none of them could be the creator. It's a possibility I could be interpreting the text incorrectly. The meaning could be lost in translation. When there's a chance this is the case, I'll look at other translations. Another translation says, In the beginning, there was only chaos. Links are available in the description. However, 
it seems like a biblical flavor was inserted by the translator. If translations don't provide a clear way of interpreting the passage, I'll look at the original language. On another site, I found a Greek version which provides a definition for each word. In Greek, the phrase looks like this. Word for word, it's truly, let me tell you, indeed, the very first, chaos, began. So in Greek, it appears like chaos had a beginning. But let's keep reading. It's better if we can define the meaning of a word from the text. From night came bright air and day, whom she bore in shared intimacy with Erebus. The word for bore here means to be born of. The text goes on to say Gaia bore one equal to herself, Oranos, or starry heaven. Bore here is the same word. If Oranos began with a birth, then he definitely had a beginning. There's nothing stated in the text indicating he existed in some form or fashion before his birth. Therefore, I can't form an interpretation to make Oranos fit these supernatural attributes. There's simply no other passage to provide context on how the words for bore and began should be interpreted. Then Gaia and Oranos give birth to the rest of the early gods. The text says this, All of those born of earth and heaven were the most fearsome of children, and their own father loathed them from the beginning. As each of them was born, he hid them all away in a cavern of earth, and would not let them enter the light, while the huge earth was tight-pressed inside and groaned. From this passage, I can see two more indicators. The text says Oranos hates the children he made with Gaia. He hides them away and will not let them into the light of day. The text doesn't say he hated them because of something wrong they did. It says he hated them from the beginning. This clearly indicates he wasn't pleased with the life he created with Gaia. That's the second indication Oranos is a false god. Are they dissatisfied with their creation from the beginning? Maybe I'm misunderstanding the Greek word. Both translations, however, translate the word as loathed. I can also see the word's meaning in the context of the passage. His actions reveal how he feels about what he's made. He hides them. Aranos either lacks power, knowledge, or the skill to create children he sees as good. Now let's turn our attention to Gaia in this story. Aranos forces Gaia to keep her children in the cavern of earth, and she is pressed and groans because of it. Even though Gaia came first, she is weaker. She lacks the power over Aranos to resist and let her children free. This is our third indicator. Are they afflicted by nature or by someone else against their will? If Gaia had the characteristics of the Creator, she at least could have overpowered Oranos, released her children, and created a new starry heaven. Her will would at least overcome his will. The text doesn't indicate why she willfully suffers his abuse. But her actions show her lack of ability. She schemes with her youngest son, Kronos, to trick his father. No explanation is given for her ungodlike efforts. Before reading about Gaia's scheme, let's look at the first few lines of this story. Children of mine and of an evil father, I wonder whether you would like to do as I say. We could get redress for your father's cruelty. After all, he began it by his ugly behavior. Though the text says Gaia wonders here and asks a question, I don't think this would be a clear indication she lacks divine knowledge. She possibly could be testing her children's bravery, for example. While looking for indicators, I want to examine how the god responds to their apparent deficiency. In this way, I can remain impartial. It doesn't matter if I think they lack power or knowledge. 
but if they feel they lack ability, as indicated by their actions. Reading on, the text says, So she spoke, but they were all seized by fear, and none of them uttered a word. But then the great crooked schemer Kronos took courage and soon replied to his good mother. Here, Gaia's children were afraid. It seems like a god shouldn't be afraid of anything. But can I consider this as an indicator? The Greek word for fear can also mean alarmed. Furthermore, such words like fear do more in language than describe the emotional state of a person. Their fear could simply mean, though they were wronged by their father, they don't want to return evil. So we can't rely solely on merely stated emotions. What about their actions? The text says they didn't utter a word. I can understand stated actions, what they say and do. But when speculating on inaction, I can't be certain about their lack of response. In the end, stated questions, them being afraid or other emotions, or lack of response can't be a clear indicator. Moving on, the rest of the story is quite graphic. I'm not going to go into detail, but Oranos, once again, is insufficient to be the creator. He's afflicted against his will by his son Kronos, and there's a sprinkling of blood upon the earth. In the story, the blood creates giants and nymphs. This would be an example of the fourth indicator. Was creation an accident or incidental to the god's motivations? It's a behavior similar to a god sneezing out the universe. This would show they lack the ability to create the universe in the way they intend from the beginning. If the Creator is all-powerful, all-knowing, and unchanging, He would create the universe according to His own desires, and His desires would be achieved from the start. I'm going to skip forward and read about the next generation of gods. Rhea, surrendering to Kronos, bore resplendent children, and Zeus the Resourceful, father of gods and men, under whose thunder the broad earth is shaken. The others great Kronos swallowed as each of them reached their mother's knees from her holy womb. His purpose was that none but he of the lordly celestials should have the royal station among the immortals. For he learned from earth and starry heaven that it was fated for him to be defeated by his own child, Zeus. So he kept no blind man's watch but observed and swallowed his children. So far, I haven't uncovered any evidence for these gods to be the creator of the universe. That is to say, there are no miracles or fulfilled prophecies in the text. Here, however, we have something resembling a prophecy. Kronos is told by Gaia and Oranos he will be defeated by his own child. The prophecy, however, isn't given as evidence for the divine, but instead Kronos is made aware of his fate. It doesn't reveal something in the future, beyond natural possibility, and no miracles are involved. As I've stated before, prophecy and miracles must go beyond natural possibility in order to be certain they are from the Creator. It's not unusual for a son to seize power from his father. Kronos may believe this, but for us, it isn't sufficient for evidence. Reading on, Rhea suffered terrible grief, but when she was about to give birth to Zeus, she begged her dear parents, Earth and Starry Heaven, to devise a plan so that she could bear her child in secrecy. Here, Rhea, a goddess, is asking her parents for help. If she was all-powerful and all-knowing, then she wouldn't need help from her parents. This led me to my fifth indicator. Is the god taught, given guidance, or is helped in some way? This goes way beyond asking a simple question. She begs her parents to devise a plan. Such an instance shows she lacks a divine character. The creator wouldn't need anything from anyone else. The whole universe which he created would be his. And what's their great plan? 
Then she wrapped a large stone in baby cloth and delivered it to the Son of Heaven, the great Lord, King of the former gods. Seizing it in his hands, he put it away in his belly, the brute, not realizing his son remained, secure and invisible, who before long was to defeat him by physical strength. Little baby Zeus is kept safe and hidden from Kronos. How can this even be possible? Nothing could be hidden from the creator of the universe. The sixth indicator for a false god is, is there anything hidden or kept from them? This shows he's not all-knowing. Kronos also is tricked and eats a rock instead of his own child. Number seven, is the god duped or tricked? Later, Zeus shows he falls short in another way. The passage reads, He set his father's brothers free from their baneful bondage, the sons of heaven, whom their father in his folly had imprisoned. And they returned thanks for his goodness by giving him thunder and lightning and the smoking bolt, which mighty earth had kept hidden up till then. With these to rely on, he is Lord of mortals and immortals. Here Zeus receives the lightning bolt. The text says he relies on these as Lord of mortals and immortals. This indicates he gains power, power to rule, power he previously lacked. Gaining power or ability shows for certain he lacks an unchanging nature. Does the god gain powers or abilities they previously didn't have? There are eight indicators so far. After reading though, I thought of a ninth indicator. Do each of the gods create a separate aspect of creation? From the attributes, we know there can only be one creator. Having a god who makes the earth and another who makes the heavens shows two gods with the power to create. But the god of the earth has only shown enough power to create the earth and vice versa. If they have more power to create the universe, this is unknown to us. Such a god isn't worth considering because they haven't even claimed to have power or knowledge to create the whole universe. If they are unable or unwilling to reveal these supernatural attributes, then we don't have the evidence we need to say they truly exist. My purpose in this video was to show how I plan to methodically evaluate all divine claims going forward. In future videos, I'll try and avoid going into such detail. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment. Thank you for sticking with me through this long video. And goodbye for now.